What's going on, Facebook? You know what time it is. It's 5.30 on Tuesday, and that means it's time for Sales Hustler Spotlight. And tonight, I am blessed to have Brandon Davis on here. Brandon Davis, we'll get to in a second. But first, before we talk to Brandon, I want to thank QuickPage, the best app in the business, the best video app in the business. If you need to send video to your customers, obviously, it's compacted. You can't send it properly. You need an app to do that. And QuickPage, I believe, is the best app in the business. I endorse it. And uh, thank you very much for uh, QuickPage for the sponsor. Now, to Sales Hustler Spotlight, I do want to tell everybody that is going to be watching tonight that if you do have some questions at the end, you're going to go ahead and put them in the comments down there, and we'll go over them together, me and Brandon. We'll go over uh, some of the questions, filter through them, and ask them a few of yours. Uh, but we're going to get started tonight. we got a bunch of questions. We're going to take you in and outside the life of Brandon Davis. Brandon, why don't you say hello to everybody in Facebook land? Facebook land, hello. Hello. Sean, <laughs> tell them, go get our people, Sean. Yeah, go get our people and bring them on in here, right? Right. Brandon, how long have we known each other now? About seven, eight months? Yeah, it's probably been, uh, yeah, seven, seven, eight months, nine months, something like that, when we first talked. Um, I kind of like to start everything uh, just getting to know you a little bit, okay? A lot of people don't know you like I know you. I know you a little bit better than they probably do, but I'd like people to get to know you a little bit. Tell me a little bit about your childhood, where you're from, and about your family growing up. Sure. So I grew up in a really small town, like in the middle of, middle of, middle of Illinois, a town called Sullivan, uh, roughly about 4,000 people. Um, not a lot to do there. We, we boasted that we had the only stoplight in the cafe. You know, the fact that we had two fast food restaurants was just mind blowing, you know, right there in the little town that I was in. Um, went to high school there, up there and, and, and graduated around 2006. That was that was when I graduated. But uh, as far as my family is concerned, you know, I, I uh, have I've been blessed with a really good family. Um, my mom and dad have really been supportive of me and everything I've ever done. Uh, we, you know, we have we had our issues like like every family does get, you know, coming up. But we uh, we stay strong. We stay stay with each other one hundred percent. So, um, and is that in Southern Illinois? Uh, it depends on who you ask. If you ask someone up in Chicago, they'll, you know they'll, they'll tell you anything. Anything below you know Naperville is, is Southern Illinois. But I, I like to say I'm more like Central Illinois. Right? It's right in the middle geographically. So it's roughly about an hour from Springfield. So it's right in the middle. The reason I ask that is because when I lived in Chicago, I lived in Chicago all my 20s, and uh, a lot of my friends there went to uh, Southern Illinois, the Salukis. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I didn't know where, where you were, were in relation to them. Um, after, uh, after you went to high school and you graduated from high school, what did you do then? Um, well, I, I didn't have much of a plan, you know, to be honest. I, uh, I was like, I was a BC student in high school. I, I never really, school never really clicked with me. I just didn't like it. It felt like I was spinning my wheels all the time um, and really not uh, garnishing me any. So um, I actually joined the military when I was 17. So I was a junior in high school when I signed the dotted line. So uh, that was the, that was the plan, you know, and I would do that since I was a little kid. My dad used to make jokes about joining the army to, to pay for college and everything he'd, he'd kind of ha ha you know laugh it off and then one day I said hey mom you know five o'clock you know and, uh, so that's what I did and I mean on my my junior year of high school right after my junior year um, I went to basic training and uh, went to basic training came back from uh, basic training did my senior year of high school um, and went back after I graduated high school to do what they call AIT, so it's your advanced individual training. It was kind of like a unique program. Uh, it's called the split option program that they let um, National Guard people do uh, back in 2005. Um, so I originally came into the military in the National Guard and I did it for about two years and I didn't care for it, to be honest. I didn't like it that much. I, was an, I joined the National Guard as an infantry soldier. Uh, so I the way I kind of looked at it was if I was getting deployed and I, I knew I probably was, that was at the height of uh, the Iraq war, kind of the beginning of the uh, Afghanistan, of Afghanistan. And uh, so I kind of knew what I was going to be doing when I got there. So I said, you know what I want to do? I want to be training and doing this every single day. So I'm ready. And I signed the papers and went active duty in, in uh, 2000, 
2007. That's so 2007, you go to Afghanistan? No, 2007, I go to Fort Hood, Texas. Okay. And uh, go to Fort Hood, Texas, I'm there, and I get there, and I'm thinking, okay, this is crazy. It's a whole new world, you know, and, and um, I, get, I get orders to go to Ramadi, Iraq. They, they told me not to even unpack my bags, you know, as soon as I got there. And um, so I'm waiting, and I'm not hearing anything. I call my mom and say, hey, mom, I'm going to Iraq. Um, she's freaking out, of course, you know, and uh, then it just never happened. They transferred me to a, a new unit that was standing up there. I went there and, and trained with that new unit for about a year and then was in Afghanistan after that. So, And what year was that? That would have been 2008 that I went to Afghanistan. So right, right around 2008. Well, you got to tell me, man, I haven't talked to a lot of people that have been at war. What is that like, man? Um. It's really high highs and really low lows, right? So, and, and, and in between all that is long drawn out periods of absolutely nothing, right? It's not up all day long, like a lot of, you know, a lot of stories would have you believe or a lot of Hollywood would have you believe. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful, it's ugly, it's humbling, you, you know, uh, keep in mind, I mean, I was 19 years old when I got there. So I, I, I sometimes think about what I would think of it now being 30, you know, how I would process the information differently than I did when I was 19 years old. Um, but, you know, in, in retrospect, in hindsight, it's uh, humbling is, is a good word for it. You know, finding out how insignificant yet how important you are at the exact same time. It, it's a really difficult thing, thing to do at 19 years old, but I think it's also an important thing. You know, I, I feel it has a lot to do with my growth as, as a human and as a, as a man. Well, let's stay on that for a second, because I, I love how when people grow, you know, and I, and I believe there's probably nothing out there that could grow you more than that. All right. So uh, probably too quick, actually. But Tell me how you think now as a 30 year old guy, you would uh, process that and tell me how you processed it then. Um, so when I was 19, I was very, I didn't think nearly de as deeply as I, as I, as I do now. So, um, you know, my, uh, people who have been close to me is saying, you know, that's kind of my gift and my curse that I, I think, I think, and I think too much. But <laughs> when I was 19, I can assure you that was not a problem in any way shape or form so uh, i was very much a roll with the punches kind of guy i let a lot of stuff roll off my shoulder nothing can touch me i'm bulletproof you know th these type of things you know anything bad would ever happen to me and um you know and and now you know i i think maybe some of some of the bravery that i would have exhibited was probably due to due to adolescence probably um, a little bit of adolescence, a little bit of ignorance. And now look, you know, I'm 30 and I wonder, would I have done some of the same stuff over there that I did when I was 19 at 30 years old, the way I think, I don't know. Um, but now I, I can tell you now, again, like I said, I, I just turned 30 in October and man, I, <laughs> it's just a different world. You kind of see things and you get to, you get to relive stuff in a more slowed down version of things to the point where you almost morph the, the happenings and circumstances. And that's, that's not necessarily healthy, you, you know? Um, but it's also, it's a way, it's how you, your brain is going to process information. I think it's how you, like you said, heal and move forward and grow and, 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 and from there. So. Well, I can't even imagine going through that brother, to be honest with you. You know, I'm not trying to glorify you or make you feel any, I, I don't want you to make you feel out of place or anything, but I'm, I'm just saying in general, I know me and, you know, I, I'm sure our minds can adjust and I'm sure I would adjust. Okay. Because that's what people do. Right. right. But just so think about it and to think about the ups and the downs and the crazy moments and the highs and lows and, and this fear and the uh, exhilaration and all the other things that you're having, man, you're probably having <laughs> such a wide spectrum of feelings right. that I don't think I could ever even put myself there unless you put yourself there. So, um, so you go through that. How long were you there? So I, I got there, in, I think it was June of 2008. It was in the summer of 2008. But I remember coming home in July of 2009. I, I came home right before the 4th of July in 2009. So, and I got back to Fort Hood in 
went straight to Fourth of July celebrations, like as soon as I got right off the plane. So, two, All right, so you come back, and uh, did you exhibit any problems? Was there was there anything that you went through after you got back? I hear that a lot. Yeah, um, I think the the biggest problem, and the biggest problem that I had was adjustment issues as far as adrenaline and boredom. You know, the it's, it's, it's interesting because I say this all the time and it may feel, it may sound a little bit, um, I don't know. I don't even know what the word is, but being the guy with the gun is a very intoxicating feeling. Um, it grabs a hold of you. And I'm not talking about necessarily from a, a violent or a scary, uh, stance, more or less just the authority to, um, the authority to, to inflict, you know, damage if need be the authority to protect the authority to help you know, things of that nature. And when you take that away and it's all you knew for 13 months um, or 12 months, whatever it was, um, it, it's, it's really difficult to, to, to adhere to that when you, when you get that taken away. So um, I had a lot of problems with, uh, and they didn't start right away. So that's the thing, you know, I, I they didn't start right away because you get home and you're just on this high, like I'm alive. You know, I'm here with my friends and, and I'm, you know, there's there's girls and there's, you know, bars and there's restaurants and there's all these things. You know, there's running water. You know, that's not even think about the little smallest things that you take for granted every single day. And you're just on this high. But eventually that high comes comes to a screeching halt. And you you reach this thing where all those things that you said you would never take for granted again. Now you just you don't even care about them. And you don't care about anything else either. And that's, that's the scary part. Um, so I think the, the feeling of significance and the feeling of fulfillment, you know what I mean? That I had just being in the army in general and, um, you know, being in Afghanistan and, and doing what we did, lo losing that was an extremely difficult thing for me um, to, the, to the point where I just entered this just absolute zone of nothingness. I didn't care about anything. I didn't love anything. I didn't want to do anything other than what made me feel good, which at the time was <laughs> three really bad things, which was alcohol, drugs, and, and girls, you know? And I got, I got those things because they made me feel alive and they made me feel the adrenaline that I used to have. And that was a problem for me for a while going forward. Well, I think... You said something, and, and we're going to go down that road there with you, Brandon, because that actually, those three things have been a vice for men forever, okay? Right. And, and, and a lot of the people that I've had on here before you, man, you right. know, it's kind of crazy. Me too, bro. Me too. So, you know, I, I, I don't ever hide anything about who I used to be, but I want to go back because you said something very interesting to me, man, when you said that when you come back, that intoxicating feeling that you had where you had ultimate power. Right. Not that you wanted it, but you just had it. Okay. Right. That, that feeling where you didn't really want it, but you have it because you walk through the streets and you have a gun on you. And, and, and basically when you come back here, it's a totally different world. And I can imagine trying to assimilate back into reality after you've been, you know, cause we can adjust after 30, 60 days, we are a habit, right? And your habit was for 13 or 12 months to walk down the street with a gun yeah. and worry about the camaraderie of your brotherhood. And I think that's probably a big thing that I would have problems with. I was living with these guys for 12 months. Yeah. Tell me about that. Tell me about coming back and not having that group of bonding. So when you come back, what happens is your unit, they do, there's a little bit of downtime. You know, everyone's a little bit laxed. You know, you don't do a whole lot of like what they call PT, phys you know, uh, physical training in the morning. Everyone's pretty chill and just enjoying their families. But slowly but surely, the unit starts to expand. Well, well, PTS, which is a permanent change of duty station. So they're going different places. And and your people that you have bonded so close are, gone, you know, and they to different corners of the earth. And it was about... I think I, I was around 22 or 23 years old when I finally figured it out that a part of my life had peaked, like it was never going to be any better. Um, and that was the fact that I had that, that friendship and that brotherhood. And, and I don't know why it took that long for me to find that I had that aha moment. Um, but at, at about 22 or 23 years old, I realized, 
Like I am never going to have friendship like I had at that time in my life ever again. And it's, it's held true now that being 30 years old, seven years after I made that decision, it's held true. And that was really hard because it makes you feel really lonely. You know, you, you come back and, and especially when you, when you start to process out of the military and you come back and you've been gone since you were 17 years old and all your friends you went to high school with that, you know, you kept up with an email. I mean, back then there was no, there, Facebook wasn't a big deal. I mean, the, the biggest, closest thing was MySpace, which is laughable now. But, uh, you know, through email or, or some people would send us a letter or I think I think Skype was still a thing back then, you know, so it would be just so rare. And you come back and you see all these people, they've gone to college, they've got bachelor's degrees and you have just started your life at 20 whatever years old, you know, and it's really hard because you feel very, very alone, you know, with with you feel like you have nothing. I know that. You know, especially when I got out of the military, I had already ran through all my money, you know, that I had gone through and in, in or that I got in Afghanistan. I had no money because I partied it all away. And so I'm sitting there, um, got out of the army, no job, no money and felt like no friend and realized that my real closest friends are gone forever. And um, that was one of the hardest things for me to, to realize that my life had peaked to a degree. So we're back into, you went back to Illinois. Is that where we went? Yeah. Okay. So we go back to Illinois. Uh, you're out of the military now. It's becoming really hard for you. So you're basically covering up all your pain with all the things that we probably shouldn't. All right. right? Tell me a little bit about that before we get into the car business, because I feel like this, this tells me a lot about who you are and being able to overcome things and stuff like that. So tell me, well, first of all, what was your drug of choice, man? <laughs> um. Basically, if it didn't have to do with a needle or a spoon, it was my drug of choice. Um, okay. But I preferred the party type upper stuff. All right. Uh, cocaine, ecstasy, LSD. You know, I was I was big into music festivals and, you know, that routine. Um, and I did that all the time. And it actually started before I even got out of the army. So, um, and I, I never, luckily had never gotten caught or never got trouble because that would have made for a very difficult process for me. Um, so I'm blessed that that didn't happen to me. Um, but yeah, I, I, and it just continued. It continued after I got out of the army, man. And I was just running around and being in how, how long, how long did you live that lifestyle then Brandon? So from, uh, it was about three years, I would say. And then a few like re relapses you know like a couple times and but the but about three years was about the time I was just going nuts you know I mean <laughs> whatever was in front of me and what I was a yes man and, and part of it was I was happy to be home and alive and the fact that I was you know pretty well behaved before I you know before I was you know, in high school and, and I'd never really experienced a whole lot of things you know I'm thinking you know I've experienced war and death and you know all these things but what life has to offer me on this side, I've not touched it. I've never tried it. I've never done any of this stuff. So I traveled and I, you know, traveled and I did drugs when I traveled and I tried different alcohol when I traveled and I went and, did, you know, tried all these different nightclubs and locations and paradises and vacation spots. And I just already all my money and all my time away. That's all I did. And all right. So, we stay in that world for about three years. Did you find the car business and that got you out of it? Or did you, were you still that kind of moved into the car business? So I actually, there's a, there's a really big Ford store um, in Colleen, which is Fort Hood, right outside Fort Hood. And I had actually applied there before I got out of the army, you know, and I don't know why I just needed a job, you know, and I just threw my application in there. And it was contingent on me getting out of the army. I was getting out in about two months. <clears throat> and they, they said, yeah, we'll hire you. Um, and then because of my, I had a girlfriend at the time um, down there in Fort Hood and, or a kind of a girlfriend, I don't, whatever you want to call it. Right. You know, and, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I, I basically messed up through drugs and other girl stuff. And 
she basically ran me out of town, made everybody hate me. So I, I just, just backed off in the car thing there for a while and I, and I went home. Right. Um, so I went back home and it was, uh, it was actually about a year before I, before I got into the business. So I tried college first, which as I said before, school didn't work for me. I hate, I just did not like it. I didn't like learning things that had nothing to do with what I wanted to do. I thought it was just a massive waste of time and had a bit of a poor attitude about it looking at right. Um, but after a while, a buddy says, Hey man, you know, I know you're down, you know, why don't you come sell cars? I'm like, man, I, I thought about it one time, but I don't know anything about cars. I can't even change my own oil still to this day. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know anything about sales, you know? And, uh, the guy's like, Hey, you, you like people, man. You like to talk, you know, come just, talk. I had my girlfriend then at the time, a year, a year later, I had, just, she's pregnant at this point. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm going to have to do something. Cause right now I'm working second shift for $11 an hour, you know, doing spot welding and going to college during the day, and not paying. So I know I will give it a whirl. And two interviews later, I was working at a multi uh, manufacturer store, GM, Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, um, in, in, in my hometown of about 4,000 people. So that was that. That's how I got in. All right. So, my lap. but uh, you're you're working there. And if I'm if I'm doing the math on this right, you're still a little messed up right then, right? I had kind of gotten away from the drugs. Okay. That, but alcohol was still a thing for me at that point. Okay. Pretty, a pretty big thing. Um, and it, it wasn't to the fact that I was drinking every day. It was that when I did drink, I drank in such excess that I was coming to work late or, or coming to work on time and, and smelling like, you know, booze and stuff. And I just, I wasn't good at the job and a lot at the time. And, and, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that my head was not where it needed to be still at that point in time. All right. So you, you, you start this, uh, uh, dealership. All right. Do you, do you hit the floor running? Are you good right from the start or is there no, tell me about that. Tell me about that. Yeah. I'm terrible, man. And a lot of it was because, um, I don't know if you've ever worked in smaller stores, um, I'm one now that believes, you know, your store size really doesn't have as much of an impact on your results as a lot of people tend to think. Um, however, it is a reality that in a small store size and a small population that the drive up lot traffic is a little bit slower. There's no doubt. There's no denying that. So I didn't have that hustle muscle that you have to have. Right. Cause I didn't, I didn't know I needed it. You know, and I didn't have a whole lot of training. I mean, I had a good staff there and my managers were good, um, but it was kind of a, you know, baptism by fire kind of a deal. Um, they walked me through a sales process a little bit. I wasn't picking it up. I was saying the wrong things. I mean, I, I'm at this point, I'm selling five to seven cars, making no money, um, just hating it. I absolutely hating it. At the time. Brandon, that's so hard for me to believe that out of you, man. You know, because I... I've watched you for a while. I know you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know you like you're my buddy forever. You know what I'm saying? But from what I've noticed, you have an extreme talent to be able to, uh, A, turn charm on, but B, you can put words together, right? So I just found like pure talent, you should be able to sell cars. But I, that just shows you that if your head's not in it and your mind's not there, I don't care what kind of talent you have, you're probably not going to do good. And, and you made a great point there that the, a small town like that OK, it is really imperative that you've got some hustle muscle in you because, yep. you know, that floor trap is just not going to be there. And pure talent's not going to win out. you got to have some uh, hustle muscle, like you said. Um, all right. So how long did you stay there? You probably didn't stay there selling five to seven cars too long. So I, uh, I'll tell you what happened. So month six rolls. It's about month six. I don't remember exactly now, but it was it's around that time, about six months in the business. And I popped like my first, I think it was like 14 or 15 cars. You know, I, I make a little money and I'm like, man, why, why haven't I been doing this every time, you know, <laughs> at this time? That's what I'm thinking. And, um, you know, I had a good month and that's when the, the motivation started. I saw what was, I saw a small glimpse of what was possible for, for not myself 
but for my family, my, my family that was on its way. Um, and, and just, I wanted to, that was the first time I was like, man, I want to do good. I, I didn't necessarily think that the car business was going to be my long-term career, but it was that, it was that crowning moment where I was like, okay, now is the, I got, I want to do good with my life. I want to stop being this loser. That's what I was. That's what I was. I want to stop being that guy, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I'm doing bad things. And I want to change that. And I, I, so I, that's when I started to really dive in. And I, back then, I think it was because I was doing these video training, Cardones and, and, and uh, uh, Alan Ram, you know, I was doing Alan Ram for a while. And I really started to listen to him to the fact where, or to the point where I, I took on Cardones and I re- le- listened to every rebuttal that he had. He had like a list of like 200 rebuttals um, or objections rather. I wrote them down and I remembered all these things and I just, I buried myself into learning what I was, whatever it is I was doing at that moment, I was going to be good at it. And that's the moment I decided. Now it didn't pan out for for a while, but I had decided that I was going to be good at what I did. Well, I find that interesting and I find it happens a lot, man, that when you find it, people are always like, well, what is your inspiration? What is your motivation? How do you, how do you become good at something? You know how you become good at something? You, you find out you're good at it and then you go, oh my gosh, I'm going to immerse myself in this because it's taken me forever to find something I'm good at. You know what I'm saying? That happens all the time. And I like that you saw, hey, man, I got some talent here. I think I can put something together. I immersed myself. Now, you said it didn't pan out. So you must not have stayed there very long. But at least you saw you were on the right road. So how long did you stay there? And where, where did you go next? I stayed there about, an, I think it was another six or seven months. I, I'd been in the business for about a year, year and a half-ish. And you have to forgive me, my timetable is a little messed up because um, one of the things I have done that I would advise every salesman watching here not to do is to switch dealerships the amount of times that I have, um, because detrimental to my overall, whereas I was doing 20 and 25, you know, 23 cars ish, I could have been, you know, well up in the thirties and and thirties, you know, mid thirties, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but I stayed there and lo and behold, I got a call from that store in Texas set and this guy's like hey man you need to come down here you know we're selling six seven hundred cars a month and i'm like holy crap you know because i'm used to like 50 you know if, if, if we hit 70 man everyone's high fiving you know what i mean it's a it's a hell of a day and i'm like man 600 cars he's like yeah we got 1100 used cars down here you know sold me he sold me you know what i mean he sold me on this opportunity and i'm thinking you know i've, I've, I've put myself in a little bit better position I want to further it. So I talked to, talked to my, my girlfriend at the time, said, hey, let's move to Texas. My son's already been born at this point. So we moved to Texas and I'm going to the, I go to that, I go to the, the uh, Ford store down there. Well, All right, so let me backtrack there for two seconds. Sure, sure. I started down there at, at a Chrysler store because the Ford store was still working on getting me on, right? It's a, it's a or it's a Jeep store. And uh, it was, the worst experience I've ever had in any store in my life. Um, and I won't say, I won't stay to say the store's name. It was just, it was an absolute cluster and uh, I had to get out of there. It was a bad situation to borderline abusive. And so then I switched to the Ford store. So in the first year and a half, I've seen three stores, you know, at this point, you know, you know, you know, not everybody, I want everybody out there that's watching, not everybody hits it right away, man. And, and if you remember, I, I think it's been, Brandon, I really believe that the, my last uh, four out of the five guests all had multiple dealerships. And really, it was a lot more of a light switch that finally kicked on. And then they they kicked it in. Um, you know, I, I remember Bill Hab telling me that, man, he floundered for a while. And I mean, you know, so so it, if you're having trouble right now, I want you to understand it doesn't mean that you suck. It doesn't mean that you're terrible. It just means that Maybe you haven't found the right store. Maybe you haven't found the right groove. Maybe you haven't found your it yet. All right. So you go to this Ford store. Yeah. All right. Now, are you clean now? Are we doing good? Are we? Clean. Okay, good. So now we can focus. We've been doing Cardone. We're all excited. We're jacked up for our future, right? Did you hit that store running? Yeah. So I, I jumped on the floor. Now it was a different world. So I go from small town, handshakes and hellos 
um, you know, CRMs. We're using Promax at the first store. Uh, you know, long term follow up and and big time. It was, the follow up was the game. Okay, uh, that's how you made a living. I go to this new store. Don't even have a computer. You don't have a desk. It's a volume store. Sell them, sell them today, or forget about them. That was the mindset there, and it was it was just a, a whole different world. And I, 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 well, I didn't like it. You know what I mean that much because I liked the personal um, connection that that we did. Um, but I did sell a lot of cars. You know, I sold I sold some cars there. Um, not quite as you know much as I did later in life, but I did sell some cars there. I did. There was that that that, that year was the year that I hit. I hit twenty three, so that was my first twenty plus uh, month there or month down there. And uh, yeah, so I was just off and running. You know, there, there was so much floor traffic there. It was unbelievable. Oh, I can't imagine. I can't um, imagine what I could do at a place with floor traffic. I just, you know, I really, I've never had it. I've never had it. So, right. you know, I've always worked, I've worked in two different towns, very more small to dealership. And I can't imagine if I worked at a dealership with just floor traffic with a high skill level and floor traffic, I, I would just kill it. But anyways, um, so you obviously go back to Illinois at some point. So how, where, where does that come from? So, um, we go back and, you know, because we go back to Illinois because honestly my, my, that job was kind of ripping my family up a little bit. You know, I was working, it was like 8 AM to 8 PM at night. Um, the place was so big, you know, that you get on Saturday, grab, grab a customer at, you know, seven o'clock, they get backed up in finance and you're there till 1130, sometimes midnight, you know what I mean? On, on a Saturday. So I was never home. It was just, it was really not healthy for my family at the point. So, uh, we, we made the conscious decision to, to go back home um, to, to uh, just just to come back to closer to family. And, uh, you know, the hours were rough for for a young family. You know, my my girlfriend at the time was the much God bless her. You know, she she worked to keep because we I, I, uh, I overextended us a little bit with a really big house because I was excited you know what I mean? That we were, uh, you know, doing okay or doing a whole lot better. And, um, so we had, a, she had a lot of maintenance to take care of and it, it the whole line, she was doing it all by herself, taking care of a new baby plus her, plus her daughter. And, um, you know, so we just had to, we had to go, we had to go back. It was just best for us at the time. All right. So here's where I want to get into some of the social media stuff. All right. Because I noticed you and I've seen some of your uh, Instagrams and some of your Facebooks and some of your Facebooks, that one you had on the Las Vegas shooter. Yeah. How many views did you have on that thing? I think that one. And the crazy thing is, is that one was one that I didn't even intend to get a lot of views because had I wanted it to get a lot of views and shares and stuff like that, I would have put it on my like page or my professional page, what I call it, my business page. Right. And I have, few of those mind you a few business pages but um i just put that on my personal page because i felt people should hear what i had to say because i hadn't i had an opinion and i am a little bit out, outspoken individual but i think it ended up getting like 180,000 views or something like that that's exactly what it got it yeah. got 180,000 thousand 180,000 views right and that's crazy it's just a car salesman that had an opinion but you you do it really well I like the way you do your social media. You're very, very good at it. When did that become something that you saw as an importance to maybe your business? So I started using social media year one. You know, I was still, I used Facebook. I was doing Facebook events um, from, from year one, you know, because after that, you know, that six month period where I was like, boom, I got to get people in here. I, I've got to, you know, create my own kind of, uh, you know, create my own life basically. I started using Facebook and I started selling cars from Facebook. I started, you know, cause I didn't have any training on this at the time. There wasn't any social media, training, you know, back then that I seen or never came across it anyway. So I was just, you know, I'd sell a car and I was, I was proud of myself because I was doing something good and I would put it on, on the, on Facebook, you know, and that was all it was. I didn't think anything of it. And then the first person said, Hey man, you know, Hey, we're looking for a car too. And I thought, okay, there's, there's something here, you know? So I started doing, I started posting all, all this stuff. So back in the first year one, I saw the potential, <coughs> excuse me, 
that uh, social media had for not only my business, but so many other businesses. Because even back then, not everybody, not all the businesses in the world had transferred to being, you know, Facebook relevant, you know, at the time. Um, they weren't running Facebook ads and things of that nature. They Brandon, what year was that? What year was that? 2011. Okay, so 11 You All right. Because that's, I mean, that's six years ago. And in the social media landscape, I think that's like dog years, right? Well, it's light years, six years right. ago, and logically speaking, you know. So, so you start posting some stuff. You start getting some traction. Are you doing any of the uh, 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 videos or anything like that yet? No. Because <laughs> I'm, because I'm, I'm, I'm shy at that point. Uh, so I, That's so funny. I hear that from you because I'm like, no, you're, you are, but you're not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So at that point, I'm shy um, to be on camera, and I'm afraid of who's going to look at it and judge me and think this or think that. Now, <laughs> I can assure you that is not even remotely close to a thought process in my mind. You know, um, a part of it's not, not caring. You know, you have to have a little bit of that inside you, you know, to you, where you don't care. But part of it is knowing that you do have uh, there is something behind your words. There is some experience, some knowledge, some training, some muscle memory behind what you're saying. You can be confident in what you're saying. Back then, I did. I wasn't confident in what I was saying. And that's part of the reason I struggled selling cars, because I wasn't confident in my numbers, my product, my my my, my anything, you know. How important, because um, we have a lot of people, this is a social media age. I believe, I believe in the future, um, you don't even have to be really good at sales if you're great at marketing. That's just my belief. So how, how much do you agree with me on that? Where do you see the landscape of sales in the car business going? Should it social branding be on the forefront of people's minds? Oh, I, if you, you ask anyone close to me and they'll tell you how I feel about that. Social is the game. It is, it's not, a, it's not a future thing. It's, it's not something that's going to happen. It's, it's happening right now. Social is the game. Um, you know, we as, as, as car dealers, we fork up a lot of money to some, you know, third parties. I'm not sure if you're aware of the budgeting or not, but it's, it's atrocious. You know, some of the, the budgeting that goes to these third party sites and a lot of dealerships. And I know for a fact, just from talking to people are ignoring it. You know, they're not putting any, and I'm not talking just dealerships, but salesmen, too. They're not putting any money or branding or anything into Facebook, um, you know, and, and they're kind of making the mistake that I was making when I was young. And it was just posting cars they sell. That's great. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I, I encourage that sort of thing. However, it, there, there's a problem with that. There's no call to action. You know what I mean? You're not prompting your, your listeners to do anything uh, or to, to get a result. Um, it provides absolutely no value to to your audience whatsoever they say okay cool brandon you sold a car you know high five to you buddy you know there, there's nothing there's no value behind it um i there's there's I'm, I'm a big believer in this jab jab right hook that gary vanderchuk talks about all the time and maybe you know it's cliche to say that guy's name he's so relevant it's cliche to even talk about him right but he's right you know and and that thing you have to give a little value give some more value Give something else before you can ask for anything. You haven't earned the right to ask for a referral. You haven't earned the right to ask for an appointment or a test drive. You've got to give something in order to earn the right to, to ask for anything. I love that you said that, man. I live my life on that motto right there. Jab, 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 right hook. I, I, I just believe in it. Uh, I believe if you give, people give. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't know that that's what I was doing my whole life until I met Gary Vander. Chuck, you know what I mean? I was like, oh, that's what I do. Okay. I, I see why, you know, what he's talking about. Um, I agree with you with the social branding. I think we in the car game, though, we don't totally understand social media. And I, you know, I, I think you understand it more than a lot of the salesmen out there. That's why it's important that I had you on today. Can you explain to uh, all the salespeople that are watching, what is the difference in, in, and you think they should focus on with Instagram compared to Facebook? How is that? How do, how do we use these tools? Sure. So Facebook, you, the nice thing about Facebook, there's more users. I mean, I think we all know that, right? So it's more widely used. However, Instagram is the fastest growing social network on the planet or, or was sometime here the last time I looked. Um, 
the the demographic is going to be different you know um instagram is going to be more of the younger the millennial type type age now um the, the the people over 40 years old they are that 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 demographic is raising on instagram quite a bit um but it's it's by a lot by and large way bigger on facebook um the one big advantage that facebook has over instagram is that little share button that Instagram just does not have the, the, the ability to go viral and the ability to garnish tens of thousands of views, as we'll probably see from this stream comes from the share button that Instagram is lacking. Right. Um, Facebook ads are more prevalent because people scroll through it more. Um, I, I think um, so. I, I think if you're going to spend your own money, it's, it's, it's better used on in, in this game anyway. Um, it's more, it's better used on Facebook than it is on Instagram. If you're going to spend your own money. I, I think you're right. I think Facebook, right. Now, especially in car sales. I think Facebook is, I, it's, it's the king right now. And I really believe we need to learn how to use it more properly. I feel like posting, like you said, posting your victories, which is a car is right. great. But I loved when you said there, it has no call to action. OK, it really has no prevalence over anything other than you are sharing your victory. All right? right. It does keep your name in their face. It does keep your logo out there. But at the end of the day, I think you're so right about the call to action. And that's why video is so important. I want to ask you um, from somebody that has really done well, what do you see is the biggest problem? What is the thing that people are doing that might uh, might not be proper in social media? What do you see and you cringe? You're like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> um, if I had to narrow it down, I see there's one thing I do or the one thing that I see quite a bit is when, let me ask you a question, Sean. When you when, when a customer calls you on the phone, are you trying to sell a car? No, I'm trying to sell an appointment. Bingo. Right. So why on Facebook are we trying to sell cars on Facebook? Why? I feel like, and don't get me wrong, you know, as far as a news feed, there's nothing wrong with posting a car with a great deal, low miles, you know, five grand back of NADA, you know, that's, that's cool and everything. However, we're trying to sell a car to a group of people. It's a cold market. You know what I mean? We're looking at a cold market and just blasting our stuff at people who don't care. You know, the 99% of them won't care. Right. So the biggest thing that I, that I think people need to fo focus more on is branding yourself. Now more than ever, now more than ever, people are buying salesmen, not cars. Um, that, that, they used to say that, you know, they've been saying that since the 80s. And I don't know that it was necessarily true in the 80s. I, I wasn't around, so I don't know. But I know now it's absolutely true because the, the percentage of people who just walk up to a car dealership having never talked to anybody at that dealership is getting much smaller. Um, there, I mean, you can do almost the entire process on the internet before ever stepping foot in the floor. You can find out the invoice price, the cars, you can find out your trade value. You can do apply for, uh, financing. You know, you can get true car pricing, I mean, all these things that you can do yet. You want to, you want to sit there and just wait for people to walk up. And that's extremely, I don't want to be too harsh, but it's ignorant. Right. I mean, it, 100%. I, I say keep it real, brother. That's what yeah. this show is, man. You know what I mean? All right. So I, I see what we shouldn't do. Okay. I, I, I see that you tell me that branding is a number one important, which I agree with you. Okay. Social media is the present and the future. I agree with you. Okay. Yep. What not to do is what you told me. What would you recommend that people do to get their brand out there then? Right. Um, one, I would, I would invest heavily into learning Facebook and I'm talking paid advertisements and I know no, no one likes to hear that, right? No one likes to say you have to put your own money up. You know, that's crazy to, to some people. However, I, I would, I would invest heavily into learning those things and they're really not that hard. But the thing is, is you can target so, so profound with the amount of things you can do with advertising on Facebook is just mind blowing um, to things that you can do outside of that. I think you got to provide value. I'll tell you what I do on my dealership page now that I, you know, I'm running their internet department. Um, I, I, I do a, a themed posting schedule, you know, must go Monday, you know, Hey, this is a car. 
that I am attempting to sell, right? It's, it's, it's old age. It's been here for a while. It's crazy value. On Wednesday, we're going to do a walk around. We're going to focus on new cars. So walk around Wednesday. We're going to focus on a new car. We're going to walk around the, the features, the functions, the, the advantages, the benefits, right? All those things. We're going to walk around and we're going to show people. It's more of an educational thing. We're not trying to sell you anything. You know, we're just trying to be a show, right? We're just trying to provide um, educational and entertainment value. Friday, it's a fun fact Friday. So we do something about, you know, some of our employees or the dealership or the town or, or anything like that to, um, you know, again, we're personalizing the business because so much of what the business has been for a long time is business to consumer. And to me, that, that, that creates the barrier that we as car salesmen know so well and that consumers know so well. They, they know it's there just like you and I do. Um, when you focus more on person to person, however, the, the relationship, the process, the follow up and the future business comes so much easier when you can make it about people on people as opposed to business on consumer. Um, that's that's what I feel is, is going to be the future. Right. That those are the guys that are going to hang around. You know, those are the guys that are going to sell 20, 30, 40, 50 cars a month, you know, when they have just great relationships because they have branded themselves as the guy, the knowledge source, the dictionary of all things automobile. That is that those are the people who are going to be around for a long time. I really like that. I really like exactly what you said. Brand yourself, have good content and have it on a schedule. Okay. Uh, I do that and didn't even know that that was correct. You know, with Saturday morning meeting, Monday motivation, right. Wednesday Q&A, yep. uh, you know, things like that. I just think it's very important if you have a schedule and have a routine, people know where to find you. Right. If you keep moving around, people don't know where you live, right? But if you're there every day, they know to, to where your house is. That's yep. just the way I see things. You know what I mean? That is awesome, Brandon. You're dropping some good stuff here for everybody today. I appreciate it. Um, tell me what what would you tell a green pea at your dealership? All right. So you're internet director. You're, you say, say you moved up to GM, say you moved up to GM one day and you had a new green pea come in. What would be the, the best advice you could give that green pea? Um, I would say to be a sponge, you know, maybe that's, again, that's a little bit of cliche to, to be a sponge, but not to listen to everything. Um, because you're going to get a lot of bad advice. I, I'm a part of a lot of the, a lot of car sales, Facebook's, and there's a lot of bad advice getting posted. Um, so you need to kind of pick and choose what you want to learn and pick and choose what you don't want to learn, um, both by ear and by sight. You know, um, other than that, I, I would say, look, man, understand that the business is not going to be what the guy who is in charge. If you have a, if you have management and I'm not saying don't listen to your management because I, as a manager, wouldn't like that very much. Right. But if you have management who hasn't sold a car since 1981 and they're still giving you the get them in the door get them in the door get them in the door you know you might want to rethink that strategy because now as i said before people can get all this information because there's there's dealers out there who are going to offer this information because they're they're privy to the to the new uh, new age of how things are information now and fast that you might want to, you know, be be someone who's not afraid to give information. Transparency is the game. The the, the days of of selling stupid is is not going to pan out for you anymore. You know, you got to be transparent and you got to make people like you. Building rapport, building rapport, building rapport. You you almost can't lose. You if you if you are if you built good rapport with people, you can almost sell cars accidentally. You know, you can fall into car deals if you have rapport with people and you build rapport with your transparency. Where do you, uh, where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> that's, that's the billion dollar question, isn't it? Right. Um, well, you have a lot of, I don't know if everybody knows you like I know you, you have a lot of irons in the, in, in the fires, man. You like marketing a lot. You have your, you know, your, your, your main hustle. Then you got your side hustles. Then you got your future where you want to be. You're in a group. you you, you run a group. Uh, where do you think you're going to be in five years, man? So <laughs> I, I, I like to think, so one thing I've always wanted, what I've always wanted to do is just travel and to speak and to, to dive a little bit more into 
you know, my, my story. So I do this car thing a little bit backwards, right? So a lot of people work their full-time job and then have a side hustle as their plan A, right? I'm doing it backwards where the car business is my backup plan. Okay. And, 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 uh, you know, future employers and probably, you know, my, my current GSM probably doesn't want to hear that. However, my, my, my plan A is speaking to people and, and helping people in that aspect. You know, I, I do help uh, businesses with Facebook and stuff like that, but I don't see that as a long-term thing. That is more of a side hustle, but where I see myself in five years is traveling, talking, writing books, things of that nature. However, if that doesn't pan out, I'll be here selling cars, you know, and I'll be happy doing it. That's the thing. I, I do love this. You know, I, I do love this. However, my, my, my passion is derived from entrepreneurship and, and being my own boss and, 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 and controlling my own destiny. And that's, that's where I've gotten it. It's, it's stair step from that point, six months into the business where I said, I want to, I want to better myself and my situation. And just because now I've got to myself, you know, into management, you know, I work my way up selling 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 cars. And now I've got myself into a management position, you know, the, the drive to better my circumstance to, is not, has not faltered, has not changed or stopped itself whatsoever. So my heart is an entrepreneurship. My mind is in cars, if that makes sense. Well, I think, I think you'll be very successful and do all the things you want to do. You're well-spoken, you're smart, I, I call you a kid because I'm an old man, right? But you're a smart kid. You know what I mean? You know what you're doing. Um, I think you're going to do real good. you got to keep going with this social media because honestly, dude, I put out a video every single day and I've never even come close. To, I don't know if you boosted that. I've never boosted one. But to get 180,000 views on just giving your opinion on something is pretty amazing. And it just shows that you're doing things the right way. Um, keep keep guiding people in your social media because I'm going to tell you what, you've got a lot to teach, man. And we all need teachers, okay? Yep. Um, I got to ask this because I ask it every time, man, because it tells me a lot about somebody. All right? What is your three favorite albums of all time? Okay? If, if, if all music goes away except for these three albums, what are the three albums you're going to choose? Oh, man. That's a tough one, man. You're gonna put me on the spot. This, this is where everyone's gonna start flaming me in the comment section, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, DMX, it's dark and hell is hot. That would be oh one. man, before he went crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, before he went, <laughs> he was a beast. Um, The Doors, self-titled album, The Doors. I'm all over the place a little bit here. That's and good. Ten years, The Autumn Effect. That's awesome, man. I can tell that's that uh, party party guy in you, the uh, the Almond Brothers, man. Them and the fish, you were just ro rowing around taking uh, <laughs> all kinds of drugs. Um, hey, man, that's awesome. I love guys that are um, all over the place because that's the way I am. I can go to any kind of party, any kind of group, and listen to any kind of music, and I'll probably know it just because I listen to so much as well. Um, let's see here. I'm having a little problem with my phone here. I'm trying to get any uh, questions. Let me just look here real quick and see if there's, everybody's loving you, dude. All right, here we go. Gary Pollard, do you know the fist pump? I do, I do All know. All right, I love the fist pump, by the way. That's How many posts a day or a week would you say is a good number on all social media sites? Say that again. You know, people, uh, people ask all the time, how much should I post? Am I posting too much? Am I posting too little? What do you think is the right amount? Depends on the platform, right? So, okay, well, let's say Facebook and then Instagram or right. YouTube. He's a big YouTube guy, so. YouTube, I, I like maybe twice a week, right? So it, it doesn't have to be that frequent. On Facebook, um, depending on the thing, I mean, you don't want to just smash all your videos, you know, if you don't want to throw three videos out in one day because no one's going to watch them, you're going to saturate your personal market. Um, but I would say posting a total of, you know, two or three times a day, if you're if you're providing value in those posts is, is a good idea. Instagram, another two, three, four times a day. But again, with Instagram, you got to be a little bit careful because people are quick to hit that unfollow button. Um, you know, I, I've gained as much as, you know, I've, I've gained five or six thousand followers in a day. 
but I've lost five, six, seven hundred because I'm outspoken and I'll say things that maybe someone doesn't like. They love me for two years and then I say one thing and you're gone. You know, so you got a little bit be careful with your frequency. Um, but two to three times. You got to tell me, how do you, how do you get 5,000 000- Five thousand people in one day. Look, dude, Instagram. This is not easy. You're just saying it like it's easy, right? How do you get five thousand people to follow you in one day? What What the heck? Um, networking, right? So, uh, you know, we talk about in sales. It's networking all the time, meeting people, talking to people. I do the same thing. So I'm in people's DMs, their direct messages all the time, and I and I'm talking with people that have a larger following than me. You know what I'm saying? So I'll, I'll, I'll meet these people now. I mean, I've got people in my network with five, six, seven million followers, you know, and one, one of those pages posts my picture and says, Hey, Brandon Davis, you know, he knows what he's doing or, or whatever, go follow him. And I'll pick up five, six, 700 followers. Um, I ran a giveaway, giving away an iPhone and some other stuff. I gained like, I was like 12,000 followers in 24 hours. It was like the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, it cost me a lot of money. There's no doubt about that, but. You can, you can garnish those things. And, and that's the, actually the most frequent question I get is how do you get so many followers on Instagram? Cause my personal page is not the only Instagram page I've ever built. I've built lots of niche specific pages, cars, money, um, you know, boats, luxury life, stuff like that. Entrepreneurship, motivation, all these different pages that I would, I, I would build them to a hundred thousand followers and then I would sell them, you know, sell the page. Um, so I've had a lot of practice with, um, posting at the right times, posting the right content, knowing how to get my my pictures to the explore page and make them go uh, viral by Instagram standards. That is, that's how you're going to get them, man. And I get that question so often that actually I'm in beta phase of, of a course that teaches people how to do it. So I, cause cool. I, I get that question all the time. Yeah, I, I bet you do because you just said you had multiple pages of a hundred thousand people and you sold them. I mean, I mean, some of us can't get more than a thousand people on there and you're, you're a hundred thousand, you know, that's kind of crazy. Uh, Eddie Gilbert had a question here. Maybe you understand it a little bit better because you have BDC background or at least, you know, a little bit. Um, it says in, in the BDC, what is the content of your agents out calls? You know what that is? Can you say that again? You cut out a little. In the BDC department, what is the content of your agents out calls? Does that make sense to you? Does not make sense to me because I don't run a BDC. Okay. What I do is not a BDC. It's it's, you have to essentially look at it like an internet sales manager. I manage internet submitted leads. I have a three man sales team. They actually sell the car. So I'm not an appointment setter. Well, Brandon, I think we've come to the end today, but I want people to be able to find you, man. A lot of people uh, were on here tonight and they didn't know you. I don't think before now. And I think you uh, really did well favorably. I think a lot of People uh, saw a different side of you, but I want them to find you out of here after here. How do they do that? So you can search me on Instagram and Facebook by just typing in at Mr. B Davis two. So M R B D A V I S the number two. Um, you'll find me either way on Instagram or Facebook. I'll come up on Facebook. You'll know it's me. Cause I've got a, I'm, I'm looking slick. I got a tie on. I got about 15,000 likes on that page. And on Instagram, you'll find me at about 44, 45,000. Um, I'll be the first thing that comes up when you type that in. So come find me, guys. I do pump out some value. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't know if I can shake a stick at old Sean here, but I do pump some value here and there. So come find me you know, and uh, I'll, I'll try to engage with you as much as possible. Well, I urge everybody to find him because I found him a long time ago and we've always wanted to do something together. Um, we've said it from day one. We really like each other's content. He really does uh, state his opinion and he doesn't care if you agree with him or not. Uh, I kind of like that in people. Um, also, Brandon, did you have a good time tonight, man? Yeah, man, this was great. I, I appreciate you having me on. I, I, the, the camera, my mom says, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a camera connoisseur, you know, I, I love being in front of it and, uh, you know, have, having a, having a talk back and forth like this in front of, I don't know how many people right now. It's, it's cool, man. It's, I'm, I'm right here in my element. So I appreciate you having me on. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I want to thank uh, everybody for viewing today. Um, I also want you, uh, you know, go back and watch it again. Uh, Tell people about it. Share it. Uh, Brandon had a lot of gold coming out here today. And I also want to thank QuickPage for the sponsor. Remember, guys, if you want to send video, all right, you need an app to do it. 
Uh, Quick Page, I endorse. It's the best app, be- best video app in the business. And I don't want you guys to forget, come over and see us in Sales Hustlers, man. We're dropping some gold in that group. We're, uh, we're just a bunch of people helping everybody get better in this business. Guys, thank you very much for coming in today. And uh, Brandon, I'll check you later, brother. See you, man.